Welcome everybody to today's installment of the Monarch Conservation Webinar Series. Today's topic is Contributions of Monarch Citizen Science. This is such an important topic and we have a wonderful lineup of speakers for you today. My name is Kareen Motivans and I work here at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in West Virginia. We are co-hosting the Monarch webinar series with the Monarch Joint Venture. So today, please use the chat box to submit your questions. They'll all be answered at the end after all the presentations have been completed. In about a week, we will email all of the participants a survey link to give us your feedback on how we're doing with the series. We'll also include a link to the archive of this recorded webinar series. So I'm going to hand you off right now to Wendy Caldwell to introduce today's speakers. Wendy is the Monarch Joint Venture Coordinator. Wendy? Thanks, Corrine, and hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Caldwell. I'm the coordinator of the Monarch Joint Venture, and it's my pleasure to introduce our panel of speakers that are going to share information with you today about Monarch Citizen Science. Not in the order of presenters, but in alphabetical order. Our presenters are Sonia Altizer, who is a professor in the Odom School of Ecology at the University of Georgia. She and her students study monarch behavior, ecology, and interactions with a protozoan parasite. In 2006, she launched the citizen science project Monarch Health from her lab and also maintains a web page dedicated to monarch parasites. Elizabeth Howard is the director of Journey North, a citizen science effort to track animal migrations, including monarch butterflies. Since 1994, Journey North has been a central player in environmental education and citizen science efforts. Karen Oberhauser is a professor in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at the University of Minnesota, where she and her students conduct research on several aspects of monarch butterfly ecology. In 1996, she and a graduate student started the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, which engages hundreds of volunteers throughout North America. Chip Taylor is the founder and director of Monarch Watch, as well as a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Behavior or Evolutionary Biology at the University of Kansas. In 1992, Chip founded Monarch Watch, an outreach program focused on education, research, and conservation relative to monarch butterflies. Since then, Monarch Watch has enlisted the help of volunteers to tag monarchs during the fall migration. Without any other ado, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters, starting with Karen Oberhauser, to give you an introduction of Monarch Citizen Science. And if anyone has questions throughout the presentation, feel free to send them to me in the chat box, and I will try to keep track of things, so we'll circle back to them at the end or between presentations. Okay, thanks, Wendy, for that great introduction, and thanks, Kareen, for um, hosting this and, and helping us out with this webinar. So I'm just giving a little background here on the importance of citizen science to our understanding of monarch biology and conservation, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-author on this, Leslie Reese, who's at the University of Maryland. You can see the picture of her with a butterfly on her nose there. A famous way to get your picture taken if you're a butterfly biologist. So what I'll be talking about is giving a little background on monarch citizen science and talk about the time and scientific contributions of people's engagement in citizen science, and then some of the other outcomes that we've gained because people are involved in citizen science. And hopefully at the end of this presentation, of, of all of our presentations, you'll be really happy that everybody in the world does not agree with Nicole Kidman. Um, this is a little thing that I saw in an airplane magazine once where she said, it's so bizarre, I'm not scared of snakes or spiders, but I'm scared of butterflies. So I think that probably not very many people in the audience agree with Nicole Kidman here, but that's a good thing. Even though she's lovely, she doesn't like butterflies. Um, okay, so monarch citizen science has a long and illustrious background. The first monarch citizen science program was run by Fred Urquhart. Um, out of Canada. Um, hundreds of volunteers participated in this project, which started in the 1950s. I see Don Davis is on, in this group and probably other people who are a part of Urquhart's program. Um, this program went into the 1990s. And as I'm sure you all know, um, the data that were collected by Urquhart and, and his volunteers 
were really key in our understanding of the monarch's annual migratory cycle. And if you happen to be lucky enough to see the Flight of the Butterflies film um, that, that was an Omni IMAX film that was shown all over the continent recently, um, this film really highlights the Urquhart tagging program. As you can see from this um, script that um, gives you the, the, what the narrator says about two junior high school students, Jim Street and Dean Bowen, who joined the Citizen Science Army and spent their summer tagging monarchs. So these were the kids that were highlighted in the Flight of the Butterflies film. So right now, we have lots of monarch and butterfly citizen science programs. And in other webinars, and, and probably for this audience, we don't really need to be familiarized with the annual migratory cycle of monarchs going through their fall migration, going to the overwintering sites, migrating north in the spring, and then going through a breeding period. But the point of this slide is just to point out that there are many programs that document, many citizen science programs, that document every single phase of this monarch annual cycle. And even though we're only talking about a few of these programs today, um, we're highlighting four of them, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that there are lots of other programs, um, other tagging programs, programs that look at fall roosting sites, um, count the butterflies in the winter. Um, so there are lots of things that we won't be telling you about today, but that have been really important to our understanding of monarchs. So what I want to just spend some time talking about is how Leslie and I studied the importance of monarch citizen science. And way back, um, it's getting to be three years ago now, we contacted all of the leaders of all of the citizen science programs that we knew collected data on either monarchs or butterflies in general. And we assessed the time contributions of these volunteers in 2011, the, the most recent year for which all of the programs had data. Um, we also assigned each, each of these programs to a model of citizen engagement. So in the world of citizen science, um, people have divided different programs into different categories. And Leslie and I focused on contributory programs, which were people's engaging in monarch citizen science, and, but the program was really run out of a research institution, like a university or a museum. And people were contributing data to a program. And then there are other models um, that we lumped into a category that we called collegial, where there was a much more kind of equal sharing of, of the leadership of the program um, with non-professional non -professional scientists. Um, so this would be nature centers or butterfly houses other kinds of outreach institutions, or even citizens themselves who were, who were leading and, and taking a really active role in the leadership of the project. We also assessed the impact of these citizen science programs on monarch scholarship. So we did huge searches of every single paper we could find that was about monarch butterflies starting in 1940 through June of 2014, so we used lots of different search engines to look for these papers. We also included book chapters. And we assigned every single paper that had written, been written about monarchs to a research category and the kinds of techniques that people used to study monarchs and the settings in which the research occurred. So what did we find? So this is, there's a lot of information, and I think these slides will be archived, so you can take more time to look at it. But these are all of the programs, um, starting with the start year um, and then the end year if the program had ended. So you can go down to the insect migration, oops, here I have a little arrow here. Here we have the Insect Migration Association, um, ended in 1994. And these are the different models of each of these projects. So we have the collegial that, um, that is not run out of a research institution, which is Journey North, and lots of contributory projects. So what you can see from this column is that Monarch Citizen Science projects really cover the range of contributory projects and the collegial projects that aren't, aren't run by professional scientists. 
And then this column is the number of hours that people donated to each of these projects in 2011. So you can see Monarch Watch had lots and lots of, of hours that people spent on the project. So going down the rows here. And I'll just point out that we have the same information for butterfly projects down at the bottom. And then this column is the number of scientific papers that used data from each of those projects. So you can see um, there are a lot of papers, 71 different projects that have used data from Monarch Citizen, or 71 different scientific papers that have used data from Monarch Citizen Science projects. This is where people are volunteering. So you can see we're spread pretty well across the eastern, for, so the eastern migratory monarch range um, divided by seasons. You can see there's a lot of um, volunteering that occurs in the fall because there are so many people out putting tags on monarchs for the Monarch Watch program. Less, fewer data collected in the winter, um, but you can kind of see how the data are spread by location and by time on this slide. So now, this is kind of the crux of the, of the presentation here. Um, it's kind of exciting, I think, to see that there have been 503 peer-reviewed papers that have been published on monarchs from 1940 through June of last year. Um, we're doing well. There are a lot more that have come out since then, but this is when we stopped our study. And 17% of these included um, citizen science data. So a total of 88 of them included citizen science data. And you can see that as we go through time, so most of these early papers in the beginning were papers that were published by Fred Urquhart and collaborators with him. Then you can see when different citizen science projects come on board. Um, here's Monarch Watch Journey North and the Cape May monitoring program starting in the early 90s. And then we start to see even more papers that are published using citizen science data. So all the gray parts of these bars are papers that use citizen science data. And this is the use of citizen science data by topic. And what you can see here is that papers that are focused on population dynamics or papers that are focused on migration are more likely to use citizen science data than, for example, papers that are focused on um, GMOs or toxins. But pretty excitingly, I think, every single category has at least one paper that includes data from a citizen science project, even areas that you wouldn't think would necessarily be, um, be that conducive to, to citizen science engagement. We've learned from all of this contribution, all of these contributions by citizen scientists about the monarch annual cycle. We've learned about the migration, patterns of population dynamics, drivers of those population dynamics, and a lot about spatiotemporal patterns um, of natural enemies, um, diseases from the monarch health project, predators and parasitoids from the monarch larva monitoring project. So all of the things that are listed on these slides would have been impossible to learn without the contributions of citizen scientists. These data have been really important from a conservation perspective. Um, we understand changes in abundance and range over the life cycle, which means we can focus our conservation efforts. We've learned about the regions and habitat types that are most important to monarchs. And all of these things are helping us to make better informed management decisions. And finally, we've learned, um, a graduate student of mine and I have looked at how engaging in citizen science kind of changes people's behavior. So this is Eva Lewandowski, who did this research with me. And what we found is that citizen scientists increase their engagement in conservation actions. So we know that it's not just the value of the data, but it's the value of actually being involved in a citizen science project that gets people more engaged in conservation. So hopefully this little introduction has convinced you that citizen science is really valuable to our understanding of monarchs. And I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the team who will be talking about individual citizen science projects. Thank you. All right. So. I think you're up next, Elizabeth. OK. Hi, everyone. This is Elizabeth Howard from the Journey North program. 
and I just want to welcome you to participate in citizen science. Um, our project is uh, provides a very easy entry point with meaningful results, and I'd like to walk you through and show you what we do. Um, right now, spring migration is taking place. The monarchs are on their way up from Mexico, and people are online um, recording what they're seeing, and they're going out and they're looking for firsts of the year. So the first milkweed, and the first eggs, and the first adult butterflies. And they come to the web, and basically our motto is, when you see a monarch, we want to know about it. And as soon as these sightings are reported, they go directly to a migration map. So there's a real-time map that you can see the, the status of the migration. And you can also report on a, a smartphone app. But the central question that we're looking at is when and where. And I can show you what spring migration looks like with this animated map. Um, it's supposed to start at the beginning. It's just finishing up, it looks like. Um, each, every two weeks, there's a new color. So this is about to start back with the monarchs in Mexico as they leave in March. And I'll just let you watch it for a minute so you can see how the migration progresses. And one of the things that's exciting about this is that when you look at the changes that are taking place here, this is a time of the monarchs' lives when they are very, very short-lived. And so what we can ask is, when and where are the monarchs right now? And here's a snapshot from last week on April 23rd. And you can see that they're really concentrated down in Texas. They've spread a little bit to the north and east, but they're really concentrated in Texas. And right now, this is what the monarchs look like. The ones that overwintered in Mexico have reached the ends of their lives. And actually, most of them have probably died, if not by now, within the next week or so. They're eight months old, and you can just see from the wings how old and tattered this butterfly is. So knowing now that these are all dying, a question we can ask is when and where is habitat critical? And that map showed you the concentration in Texas. And this pie chart shows you where these butterflies' first sightings have been by state. And you can see that the habitat in Texas is absolutely critical at this time of year and will determine where most of these monarchs of the new generation will come from. So the question you have is, are the needs for the monarchs being met in Texas right now? And we'll find out within the next couple of weeks and see what comes north out of that region. So another question is, when and where is milkweed available? That's one of the monarch's needs. And you can watch this as people report in when they see their first milkweed. And then we can look and see how it relates to migration. Are the monarchs following the milkweed? Are they ahead of their milkweed? And this is a picture that I absolutely love because there's just so much information here. Look at the butterfly's wings and how old it is. And look how new the milkweed is. So it just barely, barely emerged from the ground. And this monarch clearly has not found sufficient milkweed because she's laying so many eggs on these tiny plants. And this is what's known as egg loading. And it's a sign that the monarchs are really ahead of their milkweed in this particular moment. And there are risks of going too early. Um, the obvious one in the spring is frost. And, but in general, temperature affects every aspect of a monarch's life. So looking at what's happening in the springtime with temperature tells us a lot about what's happening in the monarch's uh, life cycle. So here's a comparison for you to look at the snapshot in time. Both snapshots are May 9th. And in 2012, we had an unusually warm and early spring. And then in 2013, it was very cool and late. And again, remembering how short-lived these monarchs are, you can see that these couple weeks in their lives can really affect what we see um, throughout the rest of the year. 
we've been documenting these migrations since 1994. We've gotten much better at it over the years. Um, but again, in the butterflies' lives, if you think about dog years, and then imagine really you've got butterfly weeks or days. So again, looking at how what's taking place during these snapshots in time is really valuable. Now let's take a look at fall migration. And when the breeding season is over and the monarchs are heading to Mexico, one of the questions is, when and where do monarchs travel? And the way that we record this, one of the most effective ways, is looking at where the monarchs are forming roosts during fall migration. They have this interesting behavior, which is very similar to what we see in Mexico, where they come together in these small groups along the migration route. And when you map this migration, by looking at the roost, you can follow the track and timing all the way down to the wintering grounds in central Mexico. And pay attention to the location of this pathways, and, and then I'll show you something that we found from this. When you look at the timing, again, it's every two weeks. Actually, every week is a new color in this case, so you can see how quickly the migration progresses. And watch what's happening in the central region, and then watch the east coast. And one of the things that, that we found in looking at this more closely is that there really are two flyways where the population is concentrated. And the peak migration moving down the central flyway goes right through central Texas, a little bit to the coast, and then straight down to Mexico. Whereas in the east, the flyway really doesn't show a direct path to Mexico. The monarchs are moving much later over there, and it's much, much farther to fly. And indeed, I'm sure Chip Taylor will tell you that the tagging results show the same thing, that those east coast monarchs have a really hard time getting to Mexico. So one of the questions we ask, too, is when and where does mortality occur? And now this is a snapshot in October of peak migration as the monarchs are moving down to Mexico, and they're just concentrated in Texas. And one of the things to think about when you look at the location of the wintering sites down in Mexico is that the geography of North America has a tremendous amount of ocean. And look at the, you've got the Atlantic Ocean, you've got the Gulf of Mexico, and these butterflies have to get all the way down to Mexico and this is one of the enemies that they face. And this, I had to turn off the animation here, but what this is showing when it is animated is a strong north wind blowing out of Texas and into the Gulf of Mexico. And this is occurring right during peak migration. And we were able to document a year that, one year that the monarchs were actually showing up in, um, on the oil platforms out in the Gulf of Mexico during peak migration. So clearly, at that instance, the ocean had a huge, was a re really big source of mortality. But one of the things that I think is really important to recognize is just that the fact that citizen science generates so many good questions. When you have observers spread all across a large geographic range who are um, reporting in what they see, you just get all kinds of, you can document what's happening, and you can also raise questions about what's happening. They're very valuable. And basically, what we're doing is we're telling, with all of us together, participants are telling the story of monarch migration in real time. And people are sharing their observations, their images, their questions, their voices, and their discoveries. And it, it helps the whole migration come to life. And as Karen was saying, the value of citizen science is also in just bringing people together and celebrating this amazing migration. Now, our project has, a, has cast a broad net and is really effective at outreach. We have people participating from all three nations of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Over 60,000 registered sites re can report in. And our website has 250,000 visitors per month. And we take the information that people send in, all those pictures and observations and questions, and we generate weekly migration news pieces. And not only are these fun to read, but they also, you can go back and think of them as a journal of documenting what happens each year during fall migration and spring migration. 
And this is the arrival of the monarchs coming to Mexico last fall. And waiting in Mexico are children there who are, are you can see on their chart, they've been documenting zeros for days and days. And the butterflies finally got there quite late in fall 2013, which was also something valuable to have on record. So I just want to kind of end by saying that we love to have all of you who are listening um, involved in reporting in what you see and be part of this international celebration of monarch migration. We hope you'll join us. Thanks, Elizabeth. Take it away, Chip. Hi there, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. I'm kind of new to this technology. I keep telling everybody I was born 40 years too soon. So I'm the oldster in this group and uh, I'm having a hard time catching up with all these little details. Anyway, I want to tell you about monarch tagging today. This is something we've been doing since 1992, and there are a bunch of other people who are doing monarch tagging as well, and we're going to go through those particular programs so you know what's going on around the country. And then we'll go from there and, and talk a little bit about the results of monarch tagging, and that should help you give a, get a, a pretty good idea of how all things are uh, coming together here. Well, this is not what we mean by monarch tagging. You know, this is a monarch that's potentially going to get a ticket because of an old photo. And, um, we're not talking about tra tracking. We're, not, we're actually talking about a tagging. So we're putting a small tag on the wings of the butterflies, and we're using the recovery data from those tags and actually the tagging date itself uh, to learn a lot more about this migration. So in this particular case, uh, we want to make it clear that we are not tracking monarchs. People understand this differently from how we intend it. People think that these tags somehow have some magic uh, tracking code in them, and that's not the case. Anyway, there are several tagging programs going on around the country. One is the Southwest Monarch Study. The other one is Monarch Alert, and the Monarch Monitoring Project that goes on at Cape May. Uh, the Cape May project's been going on as long as uh, the Journey North project has been going on, and as long as Monarch Watch has been going on, both I think all three of them started in 1992 or thereabouts. All right, let's go to uh, the Monarch Monitoring Project first. This project at Cape May uh, has the following goal. Uh, the Monarch Monitoring Project is a long-term study on monarch migration through Cape May, New Jersey. It is part of the New Jersey Audubon Research Department and closely affiliated with the Cape May Bird Observatory. Uh, this is a part of New Jersey that is a peninsula. The monarchs come down the east coast. They um, accumulate on this peninsula. They form a lot of roosts there, and people are actually able to capture quite a number of them and to uh, tag them there. And so we have quite a bit of tagging data uh, from Cape May. And they also conduct road censuses to try to get an idea of the overall population. And you can see from this um, website here uh, that it, there is a summary of all of the data obtained since 1992. Uh, these data are very interesting and they show pretty much uh, what we expected to show for monarch production along the East Coast. Unfortunately, these records do not necessarily correlate with what happens as the butterflies actually move on to Mexico. Now let's talk about the Southwest Monarch Study. This has been going on for quite a few years as well. Uh, this particular program is located in Arizona, but it works uh, the southwest in a greater detail than implied by that location alone. Uh, from their website, it says, we tag monarch butterflies during their fall migration from August through November. We also tag them while they are overwintering to track their movement between sites. Tagging is conducted in Arizona, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, western Colorado, and the deserts of California. That study has produce some really interesting results. It's very clear that the butterflies from Arizona go to both California and the California coastal uh, overwintering sites and to Mexico. Now, the proportion that goes to either is of, of some interest, but is not clear at the present time. It appears that a lot of the butterflies that go to uh, the coastal wintering sites uh, along California uh, leave Arizona fairly early in the season, whereas some of those that end up going to Mexico leave a little bit later in the season, but we need to learn a lot more about this. Whether monarchs, uh, monarchs come out of Mexico in the spring is still an unresolved question, and even the origin of monarchs that reach central Arizona and southern Arizona is not clear. Some may be coming out of uh, 
uh, New Mexico, some may be coming out of Nevada. So there are a lot of things to learn, and the, hopefully the Southwest Monarch Study is going to help us learn a lot more about that. There happens to be a nice paper that's in press uh, that will be coming out describing the results so far. Now let's talk about Monarch Alert. Monarch Alert is run uh, through uh, Cal Poly, that is California Polytechnical Institute in San Luis Obispo. And in this particular project, uh, they are interested in what's going on at the overwintering sites. So they've used this particular graphic from us and to illustrate where monarchs should be tagged. And then they say on their website, we place tags on the underside of monarch wings. These tags allow us to individually identify butterflies that are later recited. Reciting information provides data on movement uh, between and among overwintering sites, persistent at individual sites, uh, population estimates per site, uh, and migration patterns in spring. If you locate a tagged monarch butterfly, please report the details about your sighting to Monarch Watch or to Monarch Alert or call that toll-free number. Uh, this is a, a, an interesting operation, and it's providing a, quite a bit of interesting details about how monarchs are moving among uh, those overwintering sites, information that we need to have. All right, let's start with Monarch Watch now and go on and talk about what we've done. We started this program in 1992. Uh, we started out with some pretty clumsy tags and had to eventually evolve a new tagging system. Uh, this is a title that I've used for a preliminary analysis that we've done for some of our data. As you may recall, there were massive winter kills in the winter of 2002 and the winter of 2004. Uh, that provided us with a lot of recoveries, and those recoveries have provided us with uh, quite a few insights as to how this migration functions and uh, where the butterflies originate, what sort of mortality they might experience on their way to Mexico, and so on. So uh, going beyond that, we, let's talk about what we're actually dealing with in the eastern part of the United States. Eastern monarchs migrate from August uh, right up to the beginning of November. Uh, they overwinter in the transvolcanic mountains of central Mexico, and the distances flown can be up to uh, 4,000 kilometers. We've had monarchs from Nova Scotia actually be collected, recovered uh, at the overwintering sites in Mexico. Uh, that's pretty astonishing. Um, the number coming out of the east is not great, but it is very revealing nevertheless. So what are the purposes for tagging in general for our program? We're interested in the origins of monarchs that, are, that reach Mexico. We're interested in the size of the population. And here's another important detail, the timing and pace of the migration. Uh, the issue here is, is the migration simply pushed by weather, or are there some overarching uh, physiological or perhaps celestial factors that are associated with the movement of these butterflies as they uh, pass through the country down to Mexico. Uh, there's probably evidence for both, both that the weather uh, has an effect and that there is probably some uh, intrinsic mechanisms here that we have yet to reveal. Um, there's a pattern there. The pattern comes up over and over and over again, but the cause and effect relationships are still a little bit elusive. All right, the relative success by latitude and longitude is of great interest because we're now in a period where we really need to focus on monarch conservation, and focusing on monarch conservation means that we need to know where the monarchs are produced and where they're successful in getting to Mexico. And we're not also interested, as Elizabeth said, in pathways and concentrations. Uh, Elizabeth showed some very nice data on those points. And um, the interesting thing, however, that she wasn't able to show you, but she has well documented, is that these pathways are not inflexible. Uh, there are times, there are years, in which the monarchs are moving much further uh, along the west part of the, uh, the Midwest than they are at other times. So it's evident that some, there are some factors that determine uh, where these concentrations are. There are concentrations that sometimes move along the coast. There are con concentrations that are sometimes more inland. Uh, there is a broad general pattern, but there's variance here, and the tagging helps re reveal that as well. We also want to compare years because things are always a little bit different from year to year, and those differences from year to year help us understand the migration a little bit more clearly. All right, this is a well-tagged monarch. I would have liked to have seen that tag just a little bit further forward on the discal cell there, and the reason we put the tag there is that the tag is close to the center of lift and center of gravity for the butterfly. 
Uh, the tag only weighs up one fiftieth of the mass of the butterfly, and therefore it is not going to inter interfere with flight in any way. The, the tag is circular, and there's a particular reason for that. The forces of adhesion are much better when you have a circular tag as opposed to having a rectangular or square tag. And so th there are some principles here that uh, you know may not be obvious to everybody, but uh, this has made this program quite a bit more successful. And you will notice that all the previous tagging programs, they're all using our tags. We developed a technology, I think it was about 1996, uh, to produce this type of tag with a special type of adhesive on the, on the back side of it so that it would stay on the butterfly most of the time for the life of the butterfly. All right, we have a monarch tag here that was, represents one of our earlier tags, and we had a, an email and a, a phone number where people could report tags. Uh, but notice at the bottom we have a three-letter code and a three-number uh, code, and that code uh, identifies each butterfly individually. Uh, every butterfly has a different code, and that was one of the difficulties in producing all of these tags, but it seems to have worked out really well. Uh, we've cycled through uh, quite a few letter and number combinations, but for each letter combination, you, as I think you can see, you end up with 99 or 9, 999 uh, tags, and then we have to move on to another letter combination. So uh, after we got to 999, we would go on to EJB, and then we go on another 999. Anyway, all of the tags that are sent out to people are recorded. And therefore, when we get a recovery, we should be able to associate a recovery with the person who actually tagged, who has issued the butterflies and tagged the butterflies. Hopefully, that person will have sent us the tagging data sheet so that we can actually uh, use the data. Now, this is what happened in 2002 when we had that massive storm that started on the on the second or started on the 12th of, of January that particular year. Uh, there were lots of dead butterflies and there were lots of tags recovered. And it was a tragedy for the butterflies, but it was a rich source of income for uh, the people down there at the overwintering sites. Uh, I just estimated, just thinking about this the other day, that we've probably paid $80,000 or more for tag recoveries uh, through the years uh, in Mexico uh, for people to people like this who have made an effort to go out there and collect a lot of tags. Now, if you look here at the lower left, what you will see is that there are three tags that are rectangular tags. Those are the old type tags. Those were the Aller tags that were first used by Urquhart, later by Brower, and also by some people out in California. Uh, we quickly decided that that type of tag killed too many butterflies, and we decided that we had to develop a new technology. It took us a while to get there, but what we're doing now and have done for many years now is much, much better than that particular technology. This will get you to some understanding about why we can still tag, because there are lots of untagged butterflies per tag. This shows 40,000 butterflies. It took us um, five days, five of us, to go through all 40,000 butterflies to determine how many tagged butterflies there were among these dead butterflies that were found under a, a winter kill. And it turned out that there were only two tagged butterflies, one with the tag intact and one in which the tag had been lost, possibly by shuffling these butterflies around. In any case, that was only one tagged butterfly for every 20,000 untagged butterflies. So when you have that kind of a ratio, you can realize that you're really not hurting the population by tagging these butterflies. And the recovery rate is so high down in Mexico that we're quite confident that uh, we're really not having a negative impact on the population. All right, this shows you the recoveries for 2001 and 2003. There's more data to this. This was a preliminary analysis. But you can see here one of the problems we get um, have in this program. We t that year, we tagged 102,000 butterflies, uh, 2,900 recovered, but we could only use the data from 90,000 butterflies because the records were incomplete for uh, about 12,000 butterflies because people didn't send us uh, their data sheets. So uh, with this citizen science programs of this sort, one of the things that's really important is the follow through by the people who are participating in this program if they don't follow up and provide the data that we need, then there's a, a bit of a problem. All right, uh, this is analysis that we recently did. It shows that uh, if you look at the top up here above this, this red box, that 90% of the uh, monarchs reaching the overwintering sites in Mexico come from that area. That area is bounded on the east from uh, uh, 80 degrees west and bounded on the west from uh, 98 degrees west. And the southern boundary of that is about 40 degrees uh, north. Uh, we've determined that less than 
10% of the butterflies, really le much less than 10% of the butterflies, originate uh, along the East Coast. This means that we have a rich target here and a very serious and difficult target in, term in terms of trying to restore monarchs because we're going to compete with agriculture and all of that green area there. Uh, that All those green dots represent uh, where agriculture is very, very intense. All right, uh, this is another way of representing that pro projection. I won't go into details here, but you get the same idea. This is simply a different map projection. So uh, well over 90% of the butterflies originate from that area, and that's our area of concentration for monarch restoration. So what have we done over the years? We've tagged over 1.2 million butterflies. We've recovered over uh, 16,000 butterflies. The percent recovered is a little over 1%. Uh, on the average, for most years, it's perhaps just a little bit under 1%. Uh, the butterflies have recovered from every state uh, east of the Rockies except Montana, uh, also from uh, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Um, we'd like to get one sometime from Newfoundland, but I don't think that's going to happen. All right, this shows you where the butterflies are tagged. Um, just two quick slides on this, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, you can see the red, the orange line here shows uh, the latitudes which the butterflies are tagged. So uh, we really start tagging a lot of butterflies when we get to 45 north, which is where uh, St. Paul is. And by the time the butterflies have passed our area, which is about 37 north, uh, we're getting a lot less tagging here. And if we go to the data for the next year, you can see the same pattern. Um, but both of these show that what you get with a black line is a much higher recovery rate per number tagged as you go further south which is interesting. It means that the butterflies, as they pass along uh, further south in the continent, have a much better success rate in getting to uh, Mexico. So why do we continue tagging? We continue tagging because there's a changing abundance of milkweeds and monarchs out there. We get changing fall conditions. We really need to have a better grip on the uh, impact of weather and droughts on this migration. And by golly, it's a whole lot of fun to go out there and tag butterflies, and it really engages the public. See? And look at when these kids show up to tag, wow, they've got every kind of net you can imagine. It's amazing. I mean, pantyhose and all sorts of stuff shows up there to catch butterflies. And it's just a lot of fun to watch, and it's a lot of fun to, fun to watch these kids uh, uh, tag the butterflies. Teachers love it. Students love it. And I think you'd love it, too, if you haven't done it. All right, that's all from Kansas. Uh, hoping you're having a good day. Thank you. Now we'll transition to Dr. Sonia Altizer at the University of Georgia. She's going to talk about monarch health and a, particularly a protozoan parasite. Thank you, Wendy. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Well, I wanted to thank Wendy and the organizers for allowing me to tell you about Project Monarch Health today. I'm very excited to talk about one of the newer and smaller monarch citizen science projects that we run out of the University of Georgia. And our mission in Project Monarch Health is to track disease or pathogens in wild monarchs and to enhance public awareness of monarch pathogens by coupling citizen scientists with scientists. I want to start by stepping back for a minute and saying when, when we think about pathogens and diseases, we probably know a lot about human diseases things like flu and cold virus and other things that make us sick. And we're probably very well aware of the signs of infection and what to look for when we as people get sick. But when we think about butterflies, butterflies around the world, there's some 20,000 odd species of butterflies around the world. When we think about butterflies, we probably don't know as much about pathogens that make butterflies sick. But in fact, there's a huge diversity of pathogens that can infect butterflies, including larger parasites like parasitic mites and parasitoids like wasps and flies. Butterflies can also be infected by multiple viruses, like the viruses shown at the top of this slide, uh, nuclear polyhedrosis virus and granul uh, granulomavirus. And then butterflies are infected by a wide range of fungi, bacteria, and protozoa, and even parasitic worms. So there are many different kinds of parasites. In fact, the whole palette of pathogen and parasite types that infects humans is also present in wild butterflies. Now, arguably the best 
studied pathogen or one of the best studied pathogens that infects wild butterflies is a protozoan called Ophryocystis electroscira. And that's the pathogen that we monitor with Project Monarch Health. And I want to give you just a tiny bit of background about this pathogen before telling you about how we monitor it with citizen scientists. So we call this pathogen OE for short. This is a protozoan. It's in the group Apicomplexa or some other, this is a nerdy thing. So, you know, some other scientists refer to this group as sporozoans. And spores of this parasite are shown in the bottom right-hand side of this slide. They're football-shaped or lemon-shaped, and they have this characteristic amber or brown color. And this image of the spores that you see in the slide is shown at about 400 times magnification. Parasites are transmitted from adult butterflies to their offspring, so from adults to caterpillars. When adults scatter dormant spores of this parasite onto milkweed leaves, and this especially happens when female monarchs lay their eggs on milkweed leaves, but other uh, caterpillars can be infected if they ingest spores scattered by unrelated adults, too. So we call this adult to larval transmission. And these adult monarchs are covered with millions of dormant parasite spores on the outside of their bodies. The caterpillars eat the spores, which develop internally inside the caterpillar's body and inside the chrysalis. And then the adults emerge, again, covered with those dormant spores. And a couple of important points are that monarchs, the spores have to be eaten by a caterpillar to cause a new infection. So adults can rub spores on other adults, but those spores stay dormant until they're eaten by a caterpillar. And then once a butterfly is infected, it doesn't recover. This is a debilitating pathogen for monarchs. Um, unlike some insect diseases, it doesn't have an incredibly high kill rate, but infected butterflies suffer a whole range of sublethal effects. They often emerge with deformed wings, they have shorter adult lifespans, and they don't fly as well as healthy butterflies. So even though we can see infected butterflies flying around in the wild, they are suffering from the negative effects of this debilitating disease. This slide just shows you a few pictures of what infected monarchs look like. So infected chrysalids, um, you can actually see lesions of parasite spores developing through the pupal integument several days before the adult monarch closes. And then really heavily infected monarchs, like the one shown in this slide, can be too weak to emerge from their pupal case or to cling to their pupal case and expand their wings so they get stuck or they're left with severe deformities. But a lot of infected monarchs in the wild look just like this one. Impossible to tell apart from a healthy butterfly unless you take a sample from its body and look at that sample under the microscope. This image shows what the parasite spores or how those parasite spores appear next to the larger scales of the monarch butterfly when viewed under the microscope at about 100 times power. So again, the smaller oval or football-shaped objects are the protozoan spores, and the larger, more teardrop-shaped objects are the butterflies or the scales from a monarch butterfly's abdomen. And it's relatively easy to tell if a wild monarch is infected by catching the butterfly taking a sample from the outside of its body in a way that doesn't hurt the butterfly, and then looking at that sample under the microscope. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we do specific sampling in just a minute. But we've used this technique to look at patterns of infection in wild populations. So before I move on to tell you about Monarch Health and the Citizen Science Project, I just want to share two quick results of what the patterns of infection in wild monarchs look like based on sampling that we've done in our lab. And so first of all, what we found is that this parasite is found in every monarch population around the world that we've looked at to date. So monarchs don't just occur in North America, but in many places around the world. And the frequency of infection varies dramatically from site to site. So at the extreme left-hand side of this graph, so this graph is showing you the, the proportion or fraction of monarchs 
in six different representative populations that are heavily infected with the OE pathogen. And in the far left of this slide are monarchs from eastern North America that migrate the farthest distance of any monarch population in the world. And in this case, fewer than 4% of those monarchs are infected. In the middle of the slide are monarchs sampled from places in the world where they migrate shorter distances or have more of an, a range expansion and contraction each year. And an intermediate fraction of those monarchs are infected. And at the far right of the slide are monarchs from South Florida that breed year-round and don't migrate annually. And in this case, we found that between 80 and 100% of these monarchs are heavily infected. So there appears to be almost an inverse relationship between how far monarchs migrate and how infected they are. Or to put that another way, we think there's a signal that monarch migration helps keep their populations healthy and helps keep parasite transmission down. And I'm going to come back to that point in a minute in terms of some, some, some findings that citizen scientists have helped us with to better understand this pattern. One other pattern that I want to show you from monitoring that we've done in the lab, so this is not citizen science data, but this is the fraction of monarchs in the eastern migratory population that are heavily infected with the OE pathogen going from 1968 up until almost the present day. And these are from monarchs that we've sampled during the fall migration and when they're overwintering down in Mexico. And what I want you to notice is that before 2002, the fraction of infected monarchs never went above 4.5%. But since 2002, the prevalence of this pathogen has increased pretty substantially. It's, it's almost tripled in the eastern migratory monarchs. And you know, instead of being 2% or 5% infected, now we're seeing 10, 12, 15% of these butterflies in the eastern migratory population being infected. And one important question is why? And again, that's a question that we think citizen scientists can help us answer. So I want to now transition quickly to tell you about Project Monarch Health. So this is, this is the citizen science project that I know best. And we've coordinated it for the past nine years from the University of Georgia. It was started back in 2006 by a very talented and motivated undergraduate in my lab, we started with just 50 volunteers, and now we've expanded to over 200 volunteers from 23 US states and three Canadian provinces. We actually um, have well over 11,000 samples that volunteers have collected to date. I think that number now is actually closer to 20,000 if we include our current or our past season's data. And overall, the sampling has helped us get a picture of where and when this, the infections by this pathogen are most common and have helped us document some potential causes of longer-term increases in infection that might be due to things that, that people are doing um, to monarchs and their habitats. You'll see, a, if you've seen a, a fair number of maps of volunteer locations. Again, we're a pretty small project, so we don't have quite as many dots on our map in terms of where our volunteers are located. But um, I wanted to point out that we do have a substantial volunteer base in three major regions of eastern North America, including the Midwest, the Northeast, and the South. And we also have volunteers, a growing number of volunteers from the West, including California. And many volunteers have now participated for four years or more in running in this project, which is impressive given that it's only been going on for, less, for, for just under nine years. In terms of who is participating, um, it's very similar in terms of the participant base in other monarch citizen science projects. Um, but one thing that surprised us is that in addition to having nature enthusiasts and retirees participate in this project Monarch Health, we have also had a lot of participation of teachers and school kids in the project. And I initially thought that this disease angle would be too abstract for children to grasp. But that wasn't at all the case. And teachers that participate have told us that their, their uh, students love putting on exam gloves and sampling the butterflies for this pathogen. They sort of, you know, back in the days when, when people knew about the TV show CSI, they pretend they were sampling things forensically for, for CSI. 
And um, some of the teachers even set up microscopes in their classroom to view the samples right there with their students. So being able to reach young children and inspire them about disease, which is not something that they get exposed to very often, was something that kind of surprised us. We would love to have more citizen scientists participate in Monarch Health. And to be a citizen scientist in our project, we send sampling kits free of charge to volunteers. And essentially what you do is you catch a monarch, you use a quick method to sample the monarch for the OE pathogen, and then release the monarch, record some data, and then at the end of your sampling season, send the samples and your data sheet back to us at UGA, where we analyze them and let you know how many of your monarchs were infected with OE. So the image in this slide in the top right shows some of the materials that are included in those free sampling kits. The first step is to catch a butterfly, um, which you can either catch a wild adult butterfly or you can rear a caterpillar to the adult stage. And on the data sheet, you keep track of whether the monarch you sampled was captured as an adult or as an egg or caterpillar. After the butterflies are caught or are closed, you can put them in an envelope, which we send to you with the sampling kit. And this um, basically keeps the monarch separate so they don't cross-contaminate each other with the pathogen before you sample it for infection. Then we send clear stickers which you peel off and press gently onto the monarch's abdomen, put those stickers on an index card, and label the card. And this index card in the monarch in the bottom right has samples from I think 12 different monarchs all lined up and numbered on that card. So this is a a technique that doesn't harm the monarchs, it just takes a little sample of scales and, and if the monarch's infected, us, the, there's going to be parasite spores in those scales. We encourage people to wipe their hands between sampling individual monarchs or to wear exam gloves because if a monarch is infected, it will be covered with millions of pathogen spores on the outside of its body. And so we don't want volunteers to be cross-contaminating their samples. So it's important to keep that in mind when you're sampling. Then you fill out a data sheet, uh, mark the monarch, release it, and mail those samples back to UGA where we receive them in our lab and process the results. So here's an undergraduate volunteer checking those samples for the Ophryocystis pathogen. We score them. We enter the information into a database in our lab, and then we email you back as a volunteer telling you what the results were for the monarchs that you sent to our lab. So you hear back from us after we've had time to process your samples. We've had some important findings that have come from monarch health, and I just want to quickly touch on two because I know I'm, I'm just about out of time. Just to tell you two things that monarch health scientists have allowed us to discover. One thing is that Monarch Health volunteers allowed us to document that the infection rates in wild monarchs in eastern North America increase over time during the course of the breeding season. So that monarchs that leave the U.S. and Canada in late summer and migrate to Mexico are basically escaping from habitats or populations where disease levels have increased to a pretty high degree. So infection levels start out really low at the start of the breeding season, and then they increase over time and peak at the very end of the breeding season. And that's something we wouldn't have known if we didn't have volunteer sampling monarchs. Another quick thing that we've learned is we've looked at what happens to infection in monarchs that skip the migration to Mexico and instead breed year-round in the southern United States throughout the winter months. And I'm going to skip ahead to just the, the result of, um, of this. So, so I'll actually go back one quick slide and just show you this map of where we compared infection rates in monarchs sampled by volunteers in the northern part of the U.S. and Canada, indicated by yellow dots, to monarchs sampled by volunteers in the extreme southern U.S. during the winter, indicated by blue dots. And this was published in a paper earlier this year, and what these results showed was that infection prevalence was five times higher in monarchs that stay in the U.S. during the winter months and breed all winter long as compared to monarchs that are sampled farther north in their breeding range during the summer 
or overwintering down in Mexico. So again, this is something we wouldn't have been able to document without our Monarch Health volunteers. So to sum up then, I think this is a program that represents maybe perhaps a more unique extension of citizen scientists in getting people involved in sampling these butterflies for disease. I find it fascinating um, because there's not a lot of citizen science projects that involve volunteers in tracking disease and wildlife. Most of the time people are looking at very charismatic species like butterflies and birds. Um, if people know anything about disease, they think it's something to avoid or they think that disease and pathogens and parasites are something that's gross. Um, but, but in fact, it's, it's a very relevant topic um, because human changes to the environment are affecting diseases in some important ways. And I think that this is one example of a citizen science project with disease-related goals that's giving us important results uh, about pathogen infections in the wild. So thanks very much for your attention. And that wraps up my presentation. Thanks, Sonia. I will transition to Karen. And I encourage you all to stick around for another 10 minutes or so to hear what this project is all about. OK. So I'm going to talk about the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, which was started in 1997. Um, when my slides come up, you'll see I have a whole bunch of um, people who have been involved with this project, including Wendy and Sonia. So this has truly been a group effort out of the University of Minnesota Monarch Lab. Um, so Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, um, people, vol people volunteer with lots of different kinds of sites, gardens, parks, roadsides, and prairies. Um, this is a pretty labor-intensive one, so compared to, for example, um, Journey North, um, people do put a lot of time into this. Um, they describe their site once a year, telling us about many features of the site. And then they do weekly monitoring, um, where they estimate monarch densities, they can track rainfall, quantify the quality of the milkweed, and estimate parasitism rates. So they can kind of pick and choose from a menu of different options. And we also have a, a place on the website where they can just see a monarch and report it in what we call anecdotal reports. So the project, like I said, has been going since 1997. There are over 1,000 sites that have been monitored. And a lot of our volunteers have multiple sites. Um, we're spread pretty much throughout the eastern migratory range um, with some sites in the west. And this graph shows you what the data look like from a typical MLMP site. And we can see a lot of things going on in this graph. So we can see, let's see, I'm going to try to get my little arrow here. Here we go. Um, we can see um, these eggs, so the black parts of each of these bars are the proportion of the milkweed plants that have eggs on them. So this is the monarchs coming back from the south, laying eggs. They kind of peak up here. And then as those mo adult monarchs start dying off and getting old, the numbers go down. And then we have a second peak of monarch eggs and, and also larvae that's the second and the third generation in the north. So these are the, uh, of the ones that are born in the United States each year, this is the second generation after the southern ones, and then the third and the fourth generation over here. So one thing you can see from this graph is that there's a lot of mortality. There are many more eggs. The black parts of the bars are a lot longer than the, the colored parts of the bars, which show the different larval instars. And we can see the timing of monarchs um, during each year. People, so this, this graph shows data from a single monitoring site. Um, you can see it's just from one site. And at this site, people monitored 230 plants every day that they went out. People can compare their data to data from a whole state. So the second graph down here shows you data from the whole state of Minnesota. It looks pretty similar to the graph from just one site in Minnesota with its low time at the end of June, early in July. So pretty much the same thing. But you can see some sites got, got monarchs earlier than this site did. So in this particular year, 2010, there were some monarch eggs in Minnesota as early as, as let's see, I, um, May 9th. We can also compare across years. So 2010 was a pretty good year for monarchs. So you can see here, here are our 2010 data. 2013, as probably a lot of you remember, was a terrible year for monarchs. These two graphs might look pretty similar, 
But if you compare the scales, so on this graph, the scale goes up to 0 0.04. And on this one, it goes up to 0.4. So this is an order of magnitude difference in the density of monarchs between 2010 and 2013 at the same site. We've also learned a lot about monarch parasitoids from the MLMP. Um, Sonia talked about one important natural enemy, and these are some other important natural enemies. Um, these are tachinid flies. You can see here these monarch larvae and pupae that have been parasitized by a fly that looks kind of like a house fly um, with these long strings coming out that the fly maggots come out of. We've also learned about a newly rediscovered parasitoid of monarchs. This is called Terramalis casotis um, in the family Terramalidae. This was first written about in 1888, and nobody has studied it in monarchs since then. Um, so we've had MLMP volunteers who have found this pupal parasitoid. Here you can see the larvae of the wasp inside a monarch pupa. These are what the wasp look like, and they're so tiny that they could fly between the hole. They can fly in the holes of a wet regular window screen. So they're very, very tiny. We've also learned one of our volunteers in Michigan, Ilsa Gebhardt, um, collected some monarchs that had tachinid flies in them. So she had a fly maggot come out of a, out of a monarch. And instead of a fly coming out of that fly maggot, she got a wasp called Paralampus hyalanus. Um, and I typed this in the chat screen a little earlier. But so this was a really amazing thing. Somehow a female wasp laid her egg in a parasitized monarch that had a, a tachinid fly in it. The, the wasp parasitized the fly. So we had the monarch, then the fly, and then the wasp. Um, the monarch was the loser in this game, as was the fly. Another thing we've learned about is the migratory behavior of monarchs. So like Journey North, we're collecting data and, and um, monarch health. We're all really interested in monarchs staying in the United States during the winter. So this graph is from Texas in 2012. And here you can see in January, um, February, and December that there were monarchs in Texas throughout the winter. So this means that not all of the monarchs are migrating to Mexico, but some of them are staying in the United States. And another thing that we've just started doing is calculating how much milkweed it actually takes to raise a monarch. Um, so we all know that monarchs require milkweed. Here we have a female laying an egg. We have the little um, caterpillar about to come out, usually just one egg per milkweed plant, but sometimes we see a lot of eggs on milkweed plants, like you can see in this picture. But we actually used MLMP data to calculate just how many milkweed plants it takes to raise a monarch. So the dark, I'm sorry that black doesn't show up very well. But we calculated using MLMP data, and I won't go through the details of this um, equation, but we used MLMP data um, to calculate actually how many monarchs that would migrate to Mexico came off of each milkweed plant. And we calculated that it took about 30 plants to produce an adult monarch. And that's because of all of the mortality that occurs um, during the egg pupal stages. Um, this is another kind of interesting finding. Um, so our MLMP volunteers bring monarch caterpillars in and raise them in their homes. And we're interested in how the stage at which these monarchs were collected affects their chances of being parasitized by these tachinid flies. And, you can, and these, the numbers down here, the numbers on this graph are the sample sizes. So we have over 4,000 reports of MLMP volunteers bringing in an egg. 1,400 bringing in a first instar and so on, up to fourth and fifth instars. And you can see that there is some parasitism. So we, if we look at this um, second instar dot on the graph, about 8% of the, the monarchs that people brought into their homes as second instars were parasitized. So these flies do get the young caterpillars, but there's a higher percentage that are parasitized if they're collected as a fifth instar. So this is another thing we've been really interested in, interested in studying. 
And we found that tachinid parasitism varies a lot from year to year. So we have some years, like 2012, where we had really high rates of parasitism by tachinid flies. And then we think perhaps because the population of monarchs was so low in 2012, we had a crash in the tachinid fly population the next year. So you can see 2013 was a really low year for monarchs being parasitized by tachinid flies. And then we went back up again in 2014. So lots and lots of things we can figure out from MLMP data. So if you're interested in doing this, and maybe Wendy can type the, um, the URL for all of the MLMP monitoring um, activities. We've, we've created a series of training videos. And here you see a picture of Wendy um, giving one of these training videos where we've um, shown people how to conduct all of the MLMP activities. So um, that's available to anyone who wants to use them. It's a whole bunch of short little videos. Um, and finally, I'm really excited about the fact that MLMP data have been used in 16, and actually we have two more, maybe three more, in press right now um, of papers. So I guess we've passed up Urquhart in the number of publications. So we're really excited about the value of MLMP data and how that's contributed to our understanding of monarchs. And you can see that a lot of other um, scientists, besides just people in my lab, have used those data. So that's really exciting to us. Um, and I'll just end by saying thanks to everyone for listening. Um, we hope that, that you've learned a little bit about all of these projects um, that you've heard about today and, and are motivated to participate in them yourselves or to get whoever your audiences are to, to join in. So thanks a lot to listening, for listening to all of us. Thank you, Karen, and thank you to everyone that stuck around. We apologize again for, for going over time. Um, we appreciate all of the information that the presenters shared with us today and all of you for your time and being here. We hope you learned some valuable information and can go out into the field and start reporting citizen science observations. So thank you all again for your time today, and, and I look forward to working all with you in some capacity in the future.